You see, when you say the word peacemaker, you can't be a peacemaker if you're in turmoil. You can't be that one to hand out the olive branch if your life is topsy-turvy. So that's what we're going to talk about today in the Sermon on the Mount. This portion is Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. To have peace with others, first you must have peace in yourself. Only Jesus can bring that. It's through that personal relationship that you get your peace as a Christian person. And if you have turmoil inside yourself, how are you? We talked about this in Sunday school this morning because this ties right in with the love message. How can you show peace, love, long-suffering, all those fruits of spirit to others if you're not at peace yourself? Finding that internal peace. Peacemaker in this context are those who promote God's peace. This peace is taken from the Hebrew word shalom. Used as a salutation by Jewish people at meeting and parting, meaning peace. And here's the part that most people don't get. That when they say that peace, it means I, I'm, I'll be waiting for your call. Now when you put it that way and you understand that, that that's part of it, the meaning of that, I'll be waiting for your call. I'll be standing here. I'm your friend. When something's going on in your life and you have a problem, I'm here waiting to hear from you. Call me first. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have somebody you know like that? That if they have a problem, you're the first one they're going to pick up the phone? I used to have that. That was my dad. When anything happened, good or bad, the first thing I did was reach for the phone and pick it up and call him and talk about it. When my dad passed away, and I caught myself up to a year later, something happened. I'd be reaching for the phone before it would strike my mind. He's not there anymore. Do you have that person in your life? Do you have somebody to bounce things off of? Well, well you say, Jesus is the one I do that with, and that's good. But you need to be a person for somebody, and somebody needs to be a person for you. That when good or bad things happen, you're the first one that they reach for. I'll be waiting for your call. In this statement, Jesus is stating that those who actively preserve, pursue peacemaking will receive an eternal reward from being the children of God as they reflect the Father's character of peace and unity. You see, that's what it, He is. He says, I'm a God of peace. He's not a God of war. He's a God of peace. And He wants from us to project that peace. How do we do that? Only if we're not in personal turmoil all the time. All right, do you know somebody, we talked about this morning, and it works here too. Do you know that person who is a Christian and they're always upset, they're always mad, they've always got a complaint, there's always something wrong? Okay. Now, they may be nice to people, but there's, there's just always something there. They're always aggravated and mad. Okay? That person doesn't have internal peace, and there's no way they can be a peacemaker if they don't have internal peace. They can't be a person for people to reach out for, to. That probably, in most cases, some people like that, that's the last person you'd want to call, right? Because yeah. you're already upset. You don't need somebody else that's already aggravated. Romans 4, 23 through 25. Now, it was not written for his sake alone 
that it was imputed to him. Who we talk about? Abraham. But also for us. God imputed righteousness to Abraham. Why? Abraham was a peacemaker. Abraham was the one who talked with God and convinced God, God, please don't destroy my brother-in-law. Please don't destroy him, even though he's doing the wrong things. I don't say he argued with God. Now, God, at that moment when he came to Abraham, he was a Christos. Does anybody understand what Christos means? It means a pre incarnation of Jesus here on earth before he came in bodily form. He came with two angels. And Abraham would sit there and bargain with him on how many people would it take to save that city. And Jesus actually listened. And they discussed it. And they got it down to just all you got to do is find a few people down there that are, that are good and I won't destroy it. And then the angels went down there. Well, guess what? They only found one. Wow. Only found one. They saved him, his wife, and his daughters. They pulled them, had to drag them out of the city before they destroyed it, before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. But he did his best. Why? Love, concern, wanting to be that peacemaker. How could Abraham do that? Because he had peace in himself. Why? He abided with God. He was close with God. Therefore, because what I'm saying here, it, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up our Lord from the dead. So because of what Abraham and the way he acted, we're supposed to act the same way, and that righteousness is imputed to us, why? Because we believe in Jesus Christ, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Now, I love this word, therefore. Whenever you see in the Bible, when you're reading along and it says therefore, yeah, you need to back up and find out what it's there for. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Je the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith unto the grace which we stand and are rejoiced in the hope of the glory of God. Why can we have peace? I said it this morning in Sunday school. I, I love using the Sunday school lessons. We can have peace because we know where we're going. When your life is in turmoil, and everything is upside down. You know what you can do? Stop for a moment and remind yourself, we won. We've already won. If you're a Christian, you've already won. You know where you're going. You know what you've got coming. You won. In that alone, it can give you peace. Paul says, in whatever situation I am, I can be happy. Whether I'm in the prison house, which at the time he wrote that he was in prison, or whether I have abundance, I can be happy. Why? Because my happiness is not relied on by the situation and the people around me. That's not what gives him his peace. His peace is in Jesus Christ. And knowing who and what and who he belongs to. Romans 14, 6 through 18. I know that I am convinced that by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. You understand you have freedom. There's nothing unclean to you. There's no sin that won't be forgiven. Oh, wait a minute. What now? Now, we're not supposed to sin. They said, Paul says, should I sin that there be more grace? Forbid it. But you are free, you are forgiven once you're a Christian for anything that you do from that point on. You have no condemnation. 
Now, will you answer before Christ for it? Oh, absolutely. When you get to heaven, all those things you did bad in your life, they're all going to get burned up. But you have no condemnation. You have no punishment because Jesus took that punishment. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. Yet, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. Oh, what is that saying? That falls into peacemaking. <coughs> I have liberty. I love this example. Guy come up to me and says, we're going after church here. We're going down to Hooters. Would you like to come? Well, I'm going to confess. I love Hooters Wings. But I had to say, no, I will not come. You go enjoy yourself. There's nothing wrong with Hooters. But you see, I'm held to a higher standard as a pastor. Because if somebody in my congregation sees me down at Hooters, what's in their mind? Well, if it's okay for a pastor to go do that, then I should be able to do this over here. And it's not up to me to destroy a weak Christian just because I know I have liberty. And there's nothing wrong with what I do, but I have to be kind to others and consider to their situation. Peacemaker. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy of the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is susceptible to God and approved by men. Live your life so you're not offending others. Yeah. We talked about this morning. That's a type of love. Giving up sacrificially what you have the right to do so it doesn't offend somebody else. Our thought. Oh, you mean give up my rights? We're all about rights. You know, our right to do this, our right to do that. Is there kindness to that? Are you showing the fruits of the Spirit? Patience, long suffering, and on. So that's something you have to consider. Jesus says you're not supposed to offend others. Colossians 1 19 and 20. For it is pleased. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to him, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, being made peace through the blood of his cross. You see, all things can be made peaceful once you hold it up to the cross. I love the little thing. Kids, it's a thing they do. What would Jesus do? They wear little bracelets with the initials on it. When you put it up, whatever you're doing, up to what would Jesus do in this situation, it clarifies. Because if you're doing and acting and projecting what Jesus would do in his life, then you can't go wrong. But when you put the word me in front of it, what do I want? How do I want this? What do I like in music? What do I like in, and I've seen break up churches in the color of the carpet. I've seen churches split over the color of a carpet. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, so, hey, craziness out in the world, it don't stay out in the world. It comes right into the church too. Okay? It's everywhere. But we as Christians, when we hold that, would Christ argue about the color of the carpet? Would Christ argue about what type of music that they're playing? I don't think so. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe on his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Folks, that's where we're supposed to get our peace from. We are reborn again as God's children. And as long as we can hold that up, you should have peace in yourself.
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. They shall be called sons of God. The peacemakers are called the children of God, or the sons of God, because through faith and trust in Jesus Christ will receive the eternal reward of being a child of God. Their knowledge of this coming reward is what makes them blessed. And their peacemaking comes from the fruits of the Spirit inside them. Peacemaking is not a fruit of the Spirit, by the way. Peacemaking is what happens when you show the fruits of the Spirit. Talked about this morning. People who are care caregivers. A person looked at me and said, I don't think I love my mama. Okay, well, let's talk about this. Do you get mad at your mama? Yeah. Does she make you aggravated? Yeah. Have you yelled at her? Yeah. What else do you do? Well, I take her to the doctor, and I feed her, and I get her to her appointments, and, and I go buy her things, and when she needs to have her nails done or her hair done, I take her down there. I said, you love your mama. Why? Because love is not a word. It is an action verb. It's not what you say. It's what you do. Peacemaking is showing that love for other people in what you do, not what you say. Are you being a peacemaker to somebody's life when their life's in turmoil and they don't know how they're going to get to the doctor and, and they have to get there because they can't get their medicine? Are you the one that steps up and says, hey, I can drive you down there. Hey, let me help you out here. It's the acts of love that show the fruits of the Spirit. Their knowledge of the coming reward is what makes them blessed. And their peacemaking comes from the fruits of the Spirit inside them. The Holy Spirit lives inside you. It says, if the Holy Spirit lives inside you, you will produce fruit. Now, people misunderstand that. Is fruit bringing people to salvation? It can be. But where does that salvation come from? From the fruits of the Spirit? From long-suffering? From love? From all those things that you do? That is the things that you do that help bring people, you being there. By the way, nobody saves anybody. You don't save somebody. God saved them. How did he save them? Through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has to touch a person's heart. And once it's touched his heart, and you happen to be there with the right scriptures and all, God touches that heart and they come to know Jesus. Congratulations, you got to be there when it happened. He may have even used you a little bit. And you read in the scripture. But it's because of the love that you showed and the fruits of your spirit that that person was able to do that. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither, and hear this, Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave or free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. When Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judah, Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth, he saw no race, no creed, no, no uh, female, male, anything else. He saw people. When Jesus dealt with people, he saw people. He did not select choose. He saw people. He saw the Jews, the Samaritans. Oh, a Samaritan. No, that hurt your feeling. A little bit. A Samaritan was that person that the Jews were not even allowed to talk to. They weren't allowed to go in their house. They weren't allowed to eat food with them or anything else. And, and here's the crazy thing. And it went back generations, hundreds and hundreds of years. 
when the Israelis went into Babylon and there were a few Jews and, and, and they, they brought in this foreign nation to run Israel while they were all in Babylon, the people that they brought in were all dying off because they didn't know how to live in that land. They were from a different land. So what did they do? They went and got some of the Jews that were in Babylon and they brought them back to teach these people how to work the land, how to fight off the animals that were in that land, all those type of things. Well, guess what? They intermarried. And they weren't pure Jew anymore. And when the Jewish nation did get back, they rejected them. And they became the Samaritans. Now you know what Samaritan is. And because of they were not pure blood Jew, they were not allowed to come to the temple. They were not allowed to worship the way the Jews did. Was that peacemaking? Was that peacemaking hundreds of years later? You see, these schisms exist all of over our world today of who we will and won't accept. We are supposed to show the fruits of the Spirit. Can we do that easy? No, through the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we're able to do these things is through the Holy Spirit and through the fruits of the Spirit. Philippians 4.9 The things which you learn and receive and hear and saw in me do these. And the God of peace will be with you. This is Jesus speaking. What did I do? How did I act? Did I talk to the Samaritan woman? Did I go, go across the sea there and take the man in the tomb and cast the devils out of him? Was I, I love this word, particular with who I shared Jesus with? With who I did good for? No, he wasn't. And he expects the same from us. Romans 4, Romans 8, 14. For as many as were led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And when it says sons, in the original language, people. We're talking about the people of God. If you are saved and you have the Holy Spirit inside you because you were saved, you are a son, child, daughter of God. You belong to the royal kingdom. You are part of those who forevermore will live. You have earned a place in heaven where you will spend your eternity. So the next question. If we'll spend an eternity in heaven, if you already have a place waiting for you, and you're living a short life of 80 or 90 years, every now and then you get somebody to lose past 90, but not very often. We've had a couple. But that is a very short span in life. I was looking at a timeline, and it shows all the way back from Abraham to today. And you can't find a pencil with a lead small enough to draw a line on that timeline that would exist or represent your life. That's how short your life is. It seems like yesterday that they were shaving my head in boot camp and I was going running the courses and stuff become a brand new sailor. Folks, that was over 60 years ago. It goes by fast. We are headed, running headlong towards eternity. And while you're here, because of Christ that lives in you, because of the love that's supposed to live in you, you should be a peacemaker in everybody you meet. Why? Because you're supposed to look like and act like Jesus. And the only Jesus some people may ever see is the one they see in you. 
Do they see Jesus in you when you're out in public? When you're dealing in the grocery store? When you're at the intersection and the light changes and the person in front of you is texting on the phone? Do they see the Jesus in you? Top pain. Being a peacemaker ain't easy. When that person is really upset and crying, and, and, and I talk to people and they say, well, I just didn't know what, when I, if I had called them, I wouldn't have known what to say. Tell me you love them. Call them on the phone. Hey, I love you. I'm thinking about you. If there's anything I do, please let me know. I don't care what their situation is. That helps. That word of encouragement, that word of love, it helps. Be a peacemaker. Not just in your life. It starts with you. But when you're dealing with your brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and your grandchildren and your children and your community and your world, Christ calls you to be a peacemaker. Thank you, Father for the time that you give us. Just go a little bit into your word and take that word peacemaker and the word love and put them together. You called us to do this. What's the number one way we can bring peace to somebody? Tell them about Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the number one way. Well, how about that Christian that is hurting? They've lost a loved one their hearts in pain. They've lost that job and they don't know what to do. They're sick at home and they got no way to get to the doctor. Are you being the peacemaker you need to be? Are you showing the verb love to the people around you? That's what we're called to do. As we move into this family time, Jesus and God Almighty is listening to you. He's got his hand to his ear and he wants to hear what you've got to say. If there's something going on in your life now, it's the time for it. The altar's open. I'm standing up here. If you need to, just sit in your seat and pray to your God because he will hear you because he loves you. I want to thank you for joining us here at Front Act Baptist Church in Cocoa, Florida. Whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, I hope you're getting a blessing from this sermon series. And I hope you have a blessed day. Thank you once again for being here. Front Act Baptist Church in Cocoa.